Thank you very much, Colin. I'm truly honored to be with you today, and I hope that soon enough we will be able to meet and uh, to see you again on Israel's northern borders and traveling in Israel, maybe in Australia, I don't know. Uh, by the way, Alma Center is named after my little girl, Alma, that was born at the same time uh, when I left the army and was looking for a nice name. Uh, if you ask yourself, but yes, we are focusing on Israel's security challenges on the northern border. And I can say that uh, today the situation is very different from the, the way it used to be when I've just started. Uh, I think that back then, uh, around six years ago, uh, I didn't uh, see, I, I couldn't imagine the scale of control that Iran will gain on, on both these borders. We still had questions about uh, the strength of Hezbollah. Uh, in Syria, it was a civil war that we didn't know exactly where this is heading. And today, the situation is that we are actually facing Iran uh, on both of these uh, borders. And I want to do today a very short overview because, you know, I can talk for hours about this topic and to give you some sense about what we are facing and uh, how this is um, challenging our security here. And of course, you know, as a statement, uh, it's clear to me as an ex-personnel in the IDF that uh, Israel will survive a, a war. Israel will survive a Hezbollah attack. Uh, we are here to stay and we don't have any other option. But um, I am not discussing whether we will survive. I want to discuss the prices. I want to discuss uh, the challenges and the problems, though I know that IDF, as we speak, is uh, protecting us and uh, doing a lot of efforts uh, to do uh, what is needed. And I want to start uh, with photo number one, which is uh, something that happened a month and a half ago while uh, Hezbollah created a few holes in the, in the fence area. I would appreciate if you share the photo with us a few holes in the fence in three different places which are not close to each other. Uh, it was like Shabbat dinner and uh, people were um, at home. There are many people that are living very close to the border and Hezbollah, no, this is number two. <clears throat> uh, Hezbollah wanted um, to create a provocation along the border with Israel and actually uh, to show uh, to the IDF, to the Israelis, that it can create holes in the fence as a retaliation to a message that actually IDF sent to Hezbollah uh, the day before while attacking a Hezbollah vehicle next to the Syrian-Lebanese border without killing anybody. Just, this is just a taste first to the potential of escalation while Hezbollah can reach to the fence of the border, get in, and very easily create holes and put some uh, items on the Israeli side. Uh, and it's also a taste to the language, to understand the language that Israel and Hezbollah are like speaking with each other with no words, lang language of messages, of uh, deterring messages, which is by the way, the key to keep it silent over here, that each of us are sending to each other. But this photo also leads me to say a uh, few words about the first challenge that I want to uh, talk about, what we call a Hezbollah offensive plan, which is either above the ground or below the ground. It doesn't really matter. And I've started with uh, discussing the changes that Hezbollah went through in the past years. Nobody imagined 10 years ago, uh, eight years ago, that Hezbollah will build operative plans to cross into Israel with big units. When I'm saying big units, okay, this is like, I don't know, um, brigades, uh, try to take over areas next to the northern border. Today, this is uh, something that everybody in, in the Israel security systems is uh, relating to and preparing for. And we understand that Hezbollah was planning that, as I've said, above the ground, beneath the ground. Ariel, I would appreciate if you would just share with us the second photo of the channel. Uh, this is just an example. IDF found six border crossing now, the previous one. Six border crossing tunnels uh, uh, along the Israeli-Lebanese border in a few uh, different places. While 
all these tunnels are located in areas that where Hezbollah went out, they could have seen uh, communities, they could walk very quickly to the nearby communities or to isolate, uh, to take over the road that leads to the community and isolate an Israeli community. You can see that the tunnels were dug in a very uh, difficult uh, place to excavate, meaning that um, the soil is rocky. Uh, it's a project of years and millions of dollars, about $5 million to each uh, tunnel. The pipes that you see inside, other than the pipe, um, the yellow one, all other wires and pipes were put there by Hezbollah, which are electricity, phone lines, uh, air condition. The stairs were made by Hezbollah. Actually, IDF didn't have to do anything uh, to make, uh, you know, to, to change the tunnel. The white pipe over there, is the way, it's like the needle that actually found the tunnel. You know, IDF had to penetrate tons of white pipes like this again and again and again every few meters along the border uh, in specific areas where it uh, assessed that there may be tunnels. And this one, by the way, it took the IDF about two months uh, to allocate. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's the deepest and longest. It's about a, a kilometer long and about uh, 80 meters deep, which is, it's truly unbelievable. I don't know if you can experience what I'm experiencing each time that I'm talking about it, but it's truly an unbelievable project that for me, not only uh, taught me about the operational logic of Hezbollah and how dedicated it is to its uh, operational um, uh, goals, but also how deep is the hate. And I always said that the hate is as deep as the tunnel. So along this offensive uh, plan of Hezbollah to enter into the galley and try to take over communities, uh, of course, everybody speak about the rockets. Uh, about 130,000 uh, rockets uh, are hidden in civilian infrastructure uh, in Lebanon. About 40, 50% of those are hidden in the UNIFIL area of operation, the UN area of operation in South Lebanon and they can target all, almost everywhere in Israel. <clears throat> uh, just uh, tonight, which probably you will be able to see tomorrow morning, uh, we are having a, our live webinar about um, a special report that we uh, are going to expose assets of Hezbollah uh, in Beirut. That, uh, you know, it's uh, an information that is usually not out there usually for intelligence uh, agencies, but we were lucky enough to trace it in the internet and we are going to expose that uh, tomorrow night. And the disinformation that we have found exemplify very clearly how Hezbollah is using its population as human shield because all these about 30 sites that we have found in Beirut are located inside a very crowded city next to the airport, next to school, next to uh, churches or a, a soccer uh, playground. Uh, and Hezbollah is saying very clearly, uh, its speakers are saying very clearly, the weapon, and I'm now quoting just uh, an expression from last week, the weapon is inside the warehouses and the homes of everybody in Lebanon. Everybody knows that. End of quotation. I want to say one more word about that as a resident of the Galilee, not yet, not yet. <laughs> In a minute, we'll get to Syria, Ariel. Uh, before we go to Syria, just to say one word, uh, I'm using a virtual screen behind me because I'm sitting in a very messy small room, which is actually my shelter at home, about uh, two square meters in the Galilee. I live about nine, 10 kilometers from the border. Uh, Everybody in Israel that have a home that was built after 91, after the uh, first Gulf War, uh, has kind of a shelter like that with an iron, uh, iron door. And, and sometimes, I don't have a window, but usually they also have uh, iron windows. And the walls are concreted, and it's safe to stay in, these, in those rooms uh, when, you have, when you hear the sirens. Uh, the problem is, and I think I have the same problem as my friends in Gaza, my brothers in Gaza, that I have about nine seconds uh, to run for shelter, and it's definitely not enough with the five children. Uh, 
another another option is the what uh, IDF calls active defense, which is uh, uh, Iron Dome. Uh, that is a system that can intercept the rockets. Uh, we're very proud of it. There are high percentage of success to this uh, uh, system, but the problem is that the assessment are that when we speak about 130,000 uh, artilleries, Iron Dome will probably not be enough to intercept all of those, and there will be damage in the next war for both sides, for the Israeli side because of the amount of rockets and for the Lebanese side because of the fact that Hezbollah is using its population as human shield. Now let's travel to Syria and take a look how all of that connected. And I want to say one statement before we start is that everything that happened in Syria in the past few years, uh, although it was supposed like to, um, I don't know, it, it was supposed to overthrow an Assad. It was a civil war. Everybody thought that maybe it will bring a change. Eventually, the winners of this war are not the rebels in Syria. The winners of this war are uh, 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 the Shiite side, the Shia, what we call the Shiite axis, uh, Hezbollah, Iran and those who came to help, which are the Russians. And actually, it was important for me to show you this very complicated map, because that way you can understand that, that Syria is actually divided to areas of influence, while the biggest one in pink, it's supposed to be the area under the control of the government, but actually, uh, this is the area that is under the control of the government and its allies, which is Hezbollah on the Israeli-Syrian border, uh, which is Iran, uh, militias, other Iranian proxies and militias, and of course, Russian presence there as well. The orange area is an area under the control of the Kurds. Uh, the green, light green area is an area under the control um, of what we used to call the rebels, but actually today these are uh, Islamic groups that are connected to Turkey. And the blue area is an area that is under the control of specifically Turkey. And where you have a light blue area, in the southern part of Syria and uh, next to Jordan, this is an area that is actually still under control of the Americans and its area, is, this area is very important. Ariel, if you can share with us a uh, map number three, uh, everybody will be able to see these roads that are actually going all the way from uh, Syria uh, to Tehran, which is on the right side of the map. And this is what everybody called the ground corridor. By the way, Alma is the only civilian organization that map the roads themselves and we have seen that there are actually three routes that Iran could use, three existing routes, but uh, uh, while the northern one and the southern one uh, are blocked either by the Kurds in the north and the Americans in the south, the Iranians are using the middle one where it's written El Bukamal on the border crossing between Iraq and Syria uh, to transfer soldiers, to transfer ammunition. They've built a big base around El Bukamal, they put a lot of uh, uh, militias over there uh, in El Bukamal. And I think this map exemplifies for us very clearly why this place, is uh, Syria, is so important uh, for Iran, while it is uh, the road to Lebanon. You have Iraq over there where you have a majority of Shiite, uh, like uh, in Iran. And that way, when they control the C Syria and they have these uh, roads open, they control the whole area, and of course, they can uh, threaten Israel as well. <clears throat> What's the good news? Uh, of course, there are good news, uh, and there are a lot of pressures in the past year and a half on Hezbollah, on Iran, with the sanctions, the corona, which was hardly appeared in the Middle East, the Arab Middle East, was very much present in Iran, and uh, there were thousands of dead. Um, there was a protest in Iran, in Lebanon, in Iraq, just before the corona, and now we see renew of this protest, at least in Lebanon. So there is a lot of pressure, but you know, um, the, the, the option of escalation is always there because Israel is attacking Iranian uh, presence in Syria, or Hezbollah presence in Syria. And uh, Hezbollah and Iran would want to retaliate without getting into war. And again, this language of deterring messages is going on. And that's why if uh, one of these sides will be too successful, 
we may find ourselves in a situation that nobody actually wanted. Uh, you may ask yourself, how come that uh, we are uh, attacking, we are Israelis are uh, attacking in Syria, but uh, not attacking in Lebanon, though everything I've just said about what is happening in Lebanon with Hezbollah. And the reason is the issue of collateral damage. The, the reason is this like mutual deterrent that was uh, created over here and the understanding that if civilians will uh, be hurt, this may take us uh, into war. Now, uh, I'll give you some uh, inside information behind the scenes of this uh, presentation. Just at the last moment, I sent uh, Joel and Ariel some uh, new photos, uh, photos of this morning, which are uh, very good to explain a uh, few things about what is happening over here. Uh, Ariel, I would appreciate if you would just put the number five. And in number five, you can see Hezbollah operatives in demonstrations that were held uh, in some of the places in Lebanon. By the way, not, not too many in South Lebanon, not too many demonstrations. We thought we will see more. Uh, for uh, what we call the day of the withdrawal, uh, 20 years, this week we mentioned 20 years from, for the Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon. <clears throat> By the way, also in Alma Center, we made webinars about that and we discussed that a lot. And in the other side in Lebanon, we expected to see celebrations and we saw very little, but this was one of them that happened just this morning on our border, very close to where I live. And they are uh, saluting in the Nazi style. I hope you can understand that, okay? Uh, what does that mean? Few things you can learn uh, from how come Hezbollah is using its population to human sh as human shield. How what, what people are afraid? People are truly supporting Hezbollah. They are getting paid. What is exactly happening over there? And our understanding is that Hezbollah is fully interacted, engaged, and even controlling the everyday life of the people there. So you see many community events. Uh, you don't always see this kind of anti-Semitic uh, event, but you do see a lot of community events that enable Hezbollah uh, to indoctrinate its own narrative, which is hate to Israel and the West, a martyrdom, a Islamic revolution or Shiite uh, values. And this is happening by a huge uh, system, civilian wing, whatever you want to name it, that is actually the enabler for the military wing because the, the mother knows that if she will refuse to Hezbollah to hide the rockets in her homes, in her home, uh, Hezbollah will not give her uh, allowances, medical services in the Corona time, for example, food uh, during the Corona, during the Ramadan, uh, free uh, study in Iran, uh, summer school, women organizations, and more and more uh, on top of all of that. Uh, so this uh, photo was one example, but I want to I want to show a, a short video as well from the same demonstration this morning. Uh, if you can put us uh, number six, please, because the first question I asked when I've started this project of Alma was, okay, what's the alternative? What can we do? What 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 the Lebanese can do? And we know that there is Hezbollah leading the Shiites, and there is another uh, movement named Amal, which was also a political party, very strong in Lebanon. But when I see this demonstration here, you can see yellow flags of Hezbollah, and you can also see green flags, which are the green flags of Amal. And what you can learn from that, and of course there is a lot of information that supports that, is that uh, uh, they're, they're coexisting. They are maybe sometimes they're rivals, but actually they coexist and this is not obvious. It was not the case uh, in the past in Lebanon. In the past elections, by the way, two years ago, they ran together, Hezbollah and Amman. Bottom line, I'm going back to my initial statement. Uh, Iran is on our borders and in the Middle East. Uh, you know, it's very easy to understand what's the reality if you just look at what is happening on the ground. If you can share with us the seventh uh, photo, you can see uh, you know, the whole story in one picture. Because you can see, and again, this is from this morning, uh, next to the Israeli-Lebanese border. 
uh, demonstrations for this, uh, the day of the withdrawal 20 years ago. And you can see a Palestinian flag there, Hezbollah flag, and uh, three leaders, which two of them are Iranians, uh, Abu el Muandes and Suleimani, that were assassinated in Iraq six months ago by the Americans. Uh, they were the commanders of the uh, Iranian and Shiite militias in Iraq and Syria. And uh, the, right, the guy on the right with the black beard is Murnia, who was a, a leading commander in uh, Hezbollah, number two in Hezbollah, and he was assassinated in 2008. And the fact that these three are together in a poster next to the Israeli border in Lebanon, with, by the way, I don't see a Lebanese flag here, uh, for me, that tells the whole story of how they use uh, or wave the flag of the Palestinian issue in order to promote the Iranian interest uh, next to our border. I think I will end up with that, and now we can open it for questions. Right, Toda, thank you, Sarit, for that. I'll just wait for the spotlight to come on me. Thank you. I'll actually take liberty, if I can, of asking the first question. Uh, now, given the situation with Hezbollah and the precarious situation that uh, that exists on the border there, how likely do you think that Israel will come into a direct conflict with Hezbollah in the next couple of years? And what should uh, friendly countries and allies of Israel, such as Australia, do to prevent it? Nobody can anticipate uh, when exactly the war uh, will start, whether it would be tomorrow or, <clears throat> or it would be the next year or it would be in 10 years. Nobody anticipated that in the end of the war in 2006, uh, we will have uh, 14 years without war on the northern border. Uh, so I, can, I can't know. I can speak about scenarios. So I've mentioned one scenario, which is the escalation option. And the other scenario is a scenario uh, that uh, will derive from a decision. A decision of Iran to carry out an attack against Israel and uh, maybe because of the nuclear issue, maybe because of issues in the Gulf, in the Arab Gulf, where they have conflicts with the Americans, uh, maybe because of in internal uh, interests, but uh, Iran may decide to give the order to Hezbollah uh, to carry out a, an attack or carry out a terrorist attack in a specific place, which again will lead us to the scenario of an escalation. But the option exists. Uh, every day. And, and I just take it a little bit extra when it comes to Israel's allies, as you know, Australia only designates the external security organization of Hezbollah. Uh, you've uh, briefed a number of Australian members of parliament, senior journalists, diplomats, clergy, students, advisors, you name it, we've sent them to Israel and they've met with you. What message, and well, how important is it uh, that a, an ally like Australia um, can beef up its its uh, uh, its legislation, legal legislation, and designation of an organization like Hezbollah to uh, avoid or to assist in a conflict if it comes to a head. As long as Australia and other countries are not designating the civilian wing of Hezbollah, they are enabling the military wing, and that way they are endangering not only the Lebanese and the Israelis but also themselves, because eventually terror is terror is terror, and we are experienced with uh, what we call uh, attacks, terror attacks abroad of Hezbollah that planned almost everywhere in the world, Thailand, India, uh, Azerbaijan, Cyprus, Bulgaria, uh, Argentina. Uh, this is just the example that come to my mind, Turkey. Is in the past years that uh, most of them uh, were prevented. Germany, no? Um, most of these attacks were prevented and only in Bulgaria they succeeded. While we are enabling the, the Lebanese to support Hezbollah and we are enabling the money to go to Hezbollah, we are endangering uh, not only the Israelis, again, it's a danger for everybody else. And I think this is, I must say, Joel, one more sentence. This is why I founded ALMA. I founded ALMA because I believe or I, I feel 
that uh, when people are discussing the Middle East security, they mainly discuss the Israeli-Palestinian issue. But while I'm living here in the North and I've been a researcher of this area in the past, I don't know, at least two decades, I feel that the main issue is not the Palestinian issue. The main issue is radical Islam. It may be ISIS, which is Sunni, and it may be Iran, which is Shiite. That's the main issue. And if uh, we are hiding behind, like it's a political movement or it's a, it's a political uh, party or, or a social movement, we don't understand how these systems work. There is a synergy between this civilian win and military win. There is no, no you cannot uh, uh, tear them apart. They are all connected to the same mind. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Now, again, I forgot to explain to you as, uh, to how to raise the hand again. If in the, in the participation list, which you'll be able to find at the bottom of your screen as a tab, if at the bottom of that participation list, you will see a hands up icon, I will be able to see you uh, and I will be able to call upon you. So I'm going to call on Ross Babbage to ask the next question. Ross. Thanks very much, and Sarah, uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the opening uh, presentation and coverage of uh, many of the key issues. I wonder if you could just uh, give us a bit more detail uh, and talk a little bit about uh, the range of weaponry and systems uh, that have been transferred by the Iranians uh, into that theater. The things that you really worry most about. Uh, you talked a lot about the problems of uh, uh, deployment and and stationing of. Uh, military capabilities in amongst the civil, civilian population and the obvious uh, problems that arises for collateral damage and all the rest of it in future operations. I just wonder if you can just give us a bit a clearer sense of what's happened in recent times with what they've transferred in and uh, what worries you most. Okay, uh, these are two, a few questions in the same question. Uh, the ranges of these rockets uh, can cover almost all of Israel. Uh, meaning with various kinds of artillery, beginning with mortars and missiles and everything in between, what we call short range, medium range, uh, etc. Um, and we, we knew we knew during the years that Hezbollah is holding thousands of these kind of rockets. But what happened in the past, uh, I think, year and a half, is that uh, Hezbollah and Iran decided to make these rockets accurate, which this is a game changer. This is completely different because we have known during the years that if they will launch a lot of rockets, uh, I, um, the Iron Dome will have to deal only with very few that may endanger our population and all the rest may fall in open areas and, and we can have like a situation assessment all the time. But when these rockets are accurate, this is a completely different threat and Asrallah, uh, in one of his uh, interviews, presented a map and said very clearly, we are targeting all the civilian infrastructure of Israel, which is the water plants, uh, desalination infrastructure, electricity, airport, Knesset, uh, et cetera, and, and, and populated areas as well. And uh, today the assessments are that IDF succeeded in preventing what they call the project of the PGM, the project of precision guided rockets, but they didn't prevent uh, completely the fact that Hezbollah may be holding a few tens or a few hundreds of these kind of rockets, which are more accurate. It's, it's not easy to make the rockets accurate. It's a, it needed a sophisticated process to do so, and it takes a while. Uh, but again, uh, for me as a resident of the Galilee, this is a problem, and, uh, and that's why it's important for me to, to preemptively uh, walk around that and not to wait to the time when there will be war and then we will have to deal with that. Thank you, Sarit. I'll go to uh, Aaron Shapiro for the next question. Yes. Uh, hi, Sarit. Uh, it's good to see you again. I, I wanted to ask you about um, Naftali Bennett, now that he's departed uh, the, the position of defense minister, he had a very short time there, but he did try to do a lot. I know he, he claims to have tried to do a lot, especially regarding Iran and Syria. And he did claim at the end of his tenure that there was some movement of Iran out of Syria. Did Have you seen anything that would evidence that? And um, 
in, in general, how would you uh, typify, how would you uh, sum up the, the Bennett period? And also now looking at the new defense ministry, what do you see uh, and do you foresee any major changes in the, uh, in, uh, the northern border in dealing with the defense ministry? Regarding to the northern border, I didn't see Bennett uh, changing the Israeli policy with uh, what we call uh, the campaign of uh, the gray the gray zone, okay, which is the campaign between the wars and the fact that we are trying to defend ourselves and to prevent all this military infrastructure of Iran in Syria without getting into war. I think these principles uh, were uh, the same principles in all the defense ministers along the, the past years. Uh, I, when we saw uh, these publications about Iran leaving Syria, uh, the first sentence we've said in Alma is, don't hold your breath. <laughs> and Nasrallah himself uh, talked about it in his recent speech, and he said very clearly, uh, the Iranians are, may change uh, some of the way they are deployed in Syria, and you must understand, it's not Iranians that are deployed in Syria, it's Iranians' proxies that are deployed in Syria. It, it, uh, it doesn't cost Iranian blood, okay? It's not Persian speakers. Uh, it's only, and as I said, it's advisors, which it's the civilian war to commanders, actually commanders of units. And the main one is Hezbollah. This is the most professional one. And I don't see them leaving yet. Uh, actually, what Hezbollah has, has done is to create two specific units that will take over the border between Israel and Syria, uh, the area of what we call the Syrian Golan. One unit is a company uh, to the Syrian army and it is helping with rebuilding it and training it and uh, preparing uh, the ground uh, to be capable of uh, dealing with Israel in, in future war operationally. And the other unit which uh, called the Golan Portfolio and IDF exposed this unit uh, is a unit that is dealing with planning terrorist attacks that will be uh, prepared and in times of order, and they already tried a few times to do that, launch rockets and snipers and uh, try to launch drones. So it happens a few times. So uh, Hezbollah is definitely there. If there are changes in the Iranian deployment, that could be, and I believe this is what Bennett uh, was trying to say, and these changes are almost natural because you see the map of Syria. Uh, there is only very little area which is still uh, under the control of, uh, again, what we used to call the rebels, but actually it's Islamic groups. And most of Syria is under the control of the Syrian government and its allies. And now the Iranians need needs to uh, decide where they want to put the money, where they want to be deployed, whether it's in the Israeli-Syrian border, whether it's on the seaports and other places are less needed. Uh, what was misleading, I think, is that people saw that there was some reducing the amount of flights, but Nasrallah said it, and I believe him, though he's truly a great liar, but in this respect, I believe him, that uh, there was a reduction of the flights because the, the flight, were, the airplanes were used uh, for shipments for the corona issue. And as I've said, Iran uh, suffered greatly from the corona issue. And the flights continued. They, they never stopped. They were just reducing the amount of the flights. So don't hold your breath. <laughs> Thank you for that, Sarit. I'll hand over now to Anthony Cohen to ask the next question. Thank you, Sarit, for your uh, uh, clear comments. Uh, about a year ago, there was Shirat Hadin held a conference uh, with many experts from all over the world, including Alan Dershowitz. And from what I gather, there seemed to be a clear consensus that Israel has no option other than to act preemptively. Uh, would you uh, be prepared to comment about that? I don't know what they meant, but when I think about other options, um, look, the, the, the issue of the grain zone, what I've mentioned, which is the campaign between the war, is composed of preemptive attacks but also uh, messages, okay? Also uh, deterring messages on the one hand and diplomatic effort on the other hand. So I believe that uh, 
if you want to have this kind of campaign, you cannot only just preemptively attack, you need a few more layers that uh, will support it. And some of it is the diplomatic efforts, the relationship that we had developed with Russia, uh, the efforts that we are doing in the UN to expose the Iranian presence in Syria, uh, or the Hezbollah usage of human shield, uh, the diplomatic efforts uh, with the issue of the, the designation of the civilian wing, and of course the efforts to deter Hezbollah, which is part of the dialogue that we are having, the indirect dialogue that we are having with Hezbollah. I guess this is what they meant. Now over to Oved Lobel. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Ask away. Hi, sorry. Thanks for doing this. Um, I just want to know your view about the current economic collapse in uh, Lebanon and Iran and its potential impact on Hezbollah. Do you see any serious problems developing for them? Well, the, prob the economic problems of Hezbollah started two years ago uh, with the sanctions. We have seen reorganization. Uh, we have seen a cut in the budgets. We have seen people in South Lebanon complaining uh, that they are not getting any budgets for development, building schools, and supporting the population, etc. Though eventually they voted for Hezbollah in the elections. So yes, economic situation definitely influenced what is happening. The problem is that we don't see that uh, when we speak about uh, rockets, when we speak about willingness of Hezbollah to compromise of issues that are concerning why there are sanctions or why, uh, now I forgot the term, um, uh, the international uh, currency, uh, um, why is there the international pressure when we speak about uh, financial assistance to uh, Lebanon? Uh, all this financial assistance comes with a lot of demands. And a lot of demands that uh, Hezbollah is doing a lot of efforts that Lebanon government will uh, refuse to these demands. So uh, though there are a lot of uh, pressures, uh, Hezbollah is not backing off. It is not uh, reaching its hand uh, to peace yet. Uh, it's the same with Iran. There are a lot of pressures. The, the economic situation is a problem. People went out to the streets because of that in both of these countries. But it didn't make these uh, regimes or, or these ideologies change their course. Uh, Joel, I have um, questions in the chat here. Do you want me to? Yeah, so I'm going to get to both of them now. So I'm, I'm going to go to run, Dr. Run Farat to begin with. He'll ask his questions and I'll hand over to Jer Jeremy Samuel. He'll get his opportunity as well. So I'll hand over to Dr. Run Farat to ask his question. <laughs> Can you hear me? Long time no see. Shalom, Sarif. Uh, <laughs> great to see you. Listen, I just wanted to ask about Unifil because uh, reports are saying that Unifil actually is being mocked by uh, Hezbollah, making a, a joke out of them. They're not actually useful. And they're um, always being constantly reviewed by the UN. What should be done with Unifil? Maybe it should be replaced with something different or what should be done with Unifil? Well, me and I, you and me both know that uh, it was a mistake. It was a mistake to make Unifil such a big force of 10,000 soldiers. In reality, they were supposed to be even bigger than that. Uh, in order to fulfill its mission, Unifil need to be willing to violently conflict with Hezbollah, which is not willing to do so. Uh, and each time Unifil is trying to insist on its uh, mandate and to, to uh, a cross or you know enter to a Shiite town and something of the sort it is getting beaten and attacked by Hezbollah including yesterday by the way another incident in Blade. Um, so I think that after 14 years since that war and this change in Unifil mandate it is time for conclusions and my conclusion is that we do need an international force on the border because it help it is helpful uh, when we speak about tactical issues on the border and some, somebody to moderate a little bit and lower the flames a little bit, again, it's not 100%, definitely not. But Unifil failed to prevent Hezbollah from 
rearming in South Lebanon, and that's why we don't need 10,000 soldiers there. It's a waste of money. That's my viewpoint. Jeremy Samuel. I'm unmuted. You, yeah, you're unmuted. Yep, we can hear you. Uh, um, great. Th thank you very much, Sarit. Um, fascinating and, and a little bit scary. I'll put my, it's asking me to put my video on. I'm in a, also a messy study, but hello, shalom. And thank you very much. And um, I, I guess my question is, you know, without giving away confidential and classified information, Israel's not known for sitting back and sort of taking it on the chin. Um, and you've outlined some of the measures uh, that, that can be taken. But, um, you know, is Israel doing things like we see the Chinese and the Russians doing with trying to get information and, and disinformation into their information channels? Um, you know, what are we hearing about uh, about military threats? And, and do, you, do you really think that um, the diplomatic activity is going to, to change or, um, or alter the course of anything that Iran or, or Hezbollah would be doing? Because they, they seem completely immune to any diplomatic efforts. Um, of course, I can't answer to your first question. Uh, as to your second question, I believe that we are fighting an ideology. Uh, we are not fighting leaders. It's important to assassinate Suleimani, but it's not a solution. Uh, we are fighting an ideology, and in, to this specific ideology, uh, in order to kill it, uh, you need to use its own tools. And I have described here what's their tools, and it's not the missiles and, and the soldiers. It's the uh, civilian system. That's the tools. And this is what we need to fight. On the one hand, we need to fight their tools to shut down all their civilian systems. And on the other hand, we should encourage Lebanese locals, not, not us, not Western people, uh, but finance that uh, help this to happen to establish alternatives. Because in both of these countries, Lebanon and Iran, there is no alternative. Uh, Iran is an excellent example. The Iranian opposition is outside of Iran. Uh, and the, the second problem in Iran is that the Iranian army or the IRGC in Iran are completely uh, subordinate and supportive of the, of the government, of the Ayatollahs. But there is no alternative. And in Lebanon, it's, it's, it's clear. Amal became uh, supporters or cooperative with Hezbollah. We need to help these Lebanese, and there are tons of opponents to Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, to help them develop civilian systems that can provide what Hezbollah is providing. The problem is that when I'm speaking about that, this is not a quick solution, and it's not an easy solution, and it's not even a cheap solution. Uh, it can take years. I'll uh, now hand over to uh, Ajax, editor of the Australia Israel Review, Dr. Spee Fleischer. Uh, good, uh, good evening. Thank you, Sari. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about what's going on in southern Lebanon. Um, I mean, we know Israel, when Syria was, when the regime wasn't in control of that area, Israel gave a lot of help and medical help and other help to the people of that area. Uh, now that the regime is is back in control, does Israel still have sort of good contacts or benefits from that area? Yeah, the second thing I want to ask about that area is uh, Ahud Yari, who we had a some webinar with a few weeks ago, recently wrote about a coming explosion between the people of the area and the regime. Um, are you seeing signs of that? And what do you expect to happen if that does happen? So all connections with the people in South Syria were completely disconnected the day the regime went back to this area. We don't know what happened to them. We don't know uh, whether they're alive or dead. We have said that uh, many of them were expelled. Uh, other than the 400 that we enabled them to cross into Israel and then go to, Jer to Jordan, uh, all this beautiful project of the good neighbor is completely ended. Uh, as for your second question about uh, uh, the, the Syrian government and how can we, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I lost you. Again, the second question. <laughs> the, the, uh, the second question was about, uh, Hodiari wrote a couple weeks ago that in the Dera area, there was a likely, uh, the people are, are becoming more resistant to the regime. They're not really under the control of the regime. There's likely to be an explosion of violence there sometime soon. Uh, do you think that's gonna happen? And what would be the effect if it did? 
it, it is already happening. Uh, last week, the Syrian army was sent to these areas uh, to reinforce the control of the Syrian government there. What we see in Dara are actually uh, two trends. The one is from ISIS cells that are still existing there. And the other one is from ex-rebels that are still attacking here and there. Uh, regime uh, presence in the area and then there is retaliation and there is a siege and then again the rebels attack and on top of all of that of course there is a very uh, difficult economic situation in those areas. Uh, by the way we wrote a few articles about that in Alma so you can take a look at our website but no doubt that southern Syria is an area that is uh, very unstable until today. Uh, Bear in mind that Dara was the first city where everything started with the graffiti of a few young people in 2011 against the Assad, the, against Assad. Final question, we'll hand over to Jeremy Jones. Thank you, Sarit. Uh, it's very good to hear from you and get an update like this. We discussed a little bit about what Australia might be able to do in terms of their attitude towards Hezbollah. And I wanted to press you a little bit about the question about Lebanon. Now in Australia, there's a very large expatriate Lebanon commu Lebanese community of very different backgrounds, Druze, different sorts of Christians, different sorts of Muslims. They're here in Australia. Many of them remember the good fence as I remember the good fence. They remember a Lebanon fondly, which was relatively prosperous and peaceful, and want to know what they can do to rebuild again a better Lebanon and also a better relationship across borders from Lebanon. So I was wondering, what's your message, if you have a message, to the Lebanese in Australia and New Zealand and beyond, and others who really want to make for a better world, what should they be doing? What should be their priority now if they want to contribute to a future which is not all about warfare and conflict? If they would not uh, overthrow Hezbollah from the Lebanese government, today Hezbollah controls the Lebanese government, this is relatively new, uh, they are losing their homeland. It's their interest to fight Hezbollah and to make sure that Lebanon will remain an independent country without the involvement of Iran, because Hezbollah is not taking care of the uh, Lebanese interest, but for the Iranian interest. And that's why uh, the Lebanese diaspora anywhere in the world, by the way, should support the opponents of Hezbollah in Lebanon and should help them uh, organize against Hezbollah. Because Hezbollah is the strongest organization today in Lebanon. And we've seen this even with fighting the corona uh, virus. Hezbollah was the one who led the campaign with the supply of food, medical services, nurses, doctors, uh, explaining the population. He was there much more than the government. Final question we'll have from Colin. Thanks very much, Joel. And uh, I'm just stepping in uh, and, and to thank you very much, uh, Sarit, for uh, an excellent briefing. But uh, a nightmare scenario, I believe, is if uh, Iran's proxies, both in the north, in Lebanon and Syria, but also in Gaza, uh, simultaneously uh, undertake uh, offensives against Israel. How would Israel cope with that scenario? You are just bringing me back to the first sentence of the opening. Uh, three, three fronts a war is a great challenge to the IDF, but Israel will survive uh, everything because we have no other choice. Uh, IDF is preparing also to this kind of scenario, no doubt about that. 